Well, a pleasant good evening, Red Clay community and any others who have chosen to tune in with us this evening. How excited are we to bring to you tonight another student town hall in our school district? You know, student voice is so important in Red Clay. It's critical for us to get together with our students and hear all the things that they have brewing in their minds. So we are so excited to bring this topic this month, student voice and civic engagement. So hopefully you'll be able to spend the next 90 minutes with us as we explore this topic here with this awesome group of students we have assembled this evening. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our superintendent of the Red Clay School District, Mr. Darrell Green. Thank you, Mr. Golder. Um, thank you to, again, all of those who are joining us this evening. Um, and this evening isn't so much about us, uh, but as much as it is about our student and student leaders across Red Clay. Um, I couldn't be prouder um, as we continue to uh, listen and learn um, from our students. And I think that's the, the, the biggest thing for me as superintendent, um, as we go through this process of engaging our students, is, is, is the learning opportunity that they're providing to us. So this is the second of uh, the town halls that we've put on, but the third under the red clay umbrella because we had a dynamic group of student leaders who actually facilitated their own uh, student run uh, town hall. So this is actually the third under the red clay umbrella, um, but the second being facilitated by the district. And I think it's a testament to, again, our wonderful student leaders. And so we're excited to have many of them on uh, this town hall this evening. Again, just for an opportunity for us as the leadership of the district to learn why we're leading. And so to kick us off, we have a video uh, by one of our dynamic student leaders, Kamora. Hello, my name is Kamora Briscoe, a 10th grader at Cobb Cowley School of the Arts. As a member of Red Clay, it's imperative that we share our voice for the betterment of our community. When sharing your voice, you're not only elevating your own voice, but elevating voices who may not be heard. To solve any issues that we face, we must face them together by speaking out. As we all come from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and incomes, it is crucial that we collectively use our voices to give a broad variety of opinions and perspectives to strengthen our community, along with bringing more voices to the table. As a society and school district, we must create resources that benefit us all. And always remember, it takes a village and your voice matters. asks us to collectively use our voices, we in Red Clay wanted an opportunity to make sure we brought more voices to the table tonight. So let's go around and introduce our panel members for this evening who are going to lead us through uh, this conversation. Panel leaders, if you could tell your name, your grade, and where you go to school, that will give our audience some familiarity with you to provide some context. Go ahead, Grant, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Grant Becker. I'm in 12th grade and I go to AI DuPont High School. Daniela? Hi, my name is Daniela and I am a senior at John Dickerson High School. On my screen, I see Gavin next. Hi, I'm Gavin Durham and I'm from AI DuPont High School and I'm in 10th grade. Nathan? Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm a sophomore at Conrad School of Science. Zakia. Hi, I'm Zakia Lacey, and I'm a senior at Cab Calloway. Anisha. Good evening. My name is Anisha, and I am the director at the Walnut Street YMCA. And then our very own panelist member, Dr. Tawanda Bond. I think we missed Gabby, so I'm going to turn it over to Gabby. Uh, I'm going to put that. I'm going to put you first, Gabby, on the spot. Hi, I'm Abby Campion. I'm a senior at Dickinson High School. All right, and my name is Tawanda Bond. I'm the director of Equity and Strategic Partnerships for Red Clay School District. 
All right, that's awesome. Sorry about that, Abby. That's what I get for trusting my eyes here, going, going through the Zoom screen. Uh, I'd like to start our conversation tonight by asking some of our panelists about their voices. Well, there's my phone ringing. I won't have that happen. I want to start our conversation tonight about asking some of our panelists about their voice within the school. So Anisha, the YMCA has partnered with Red Clay to produce videos, Kimura's that we just saw, and some others that we'll see later in the evening. Now, what was the purpose behind these videos and how do you see them supporting us in our work? Thank you, Mr. Goder. Um, I just want to reintroduce myself. My name is Anisha Truesdale, and I am the program director at the Walnut Street YMCA. And I get the opportunity to serve many of the team programs here. Um, and as many of you know and um, can probably agree, these past few months have just been quite exhausting. Uh, you just do from COVID to the increase of race, increasing racial tension in our country. Um, and it has been a lot for myself um, and for the young people that we serve. So both the YMCA and Red Clay School District recognized that it was necessary and important to provide a space and a platform for our young people to be able to share their voice. And so that birthed the Youth Voice Project um, video project, one that you just seen, and you will hear another one later on, um, actually from one of our youth and government alumni students. And so the purpose of the video was simple. Um, your voices need to be heard and they needed to be heard by the right people. Um, I truly believe that you all have the answers. Uh, we've seen the many Instagram posts, we've read the emails, the letters, um, and your voices are powerful. Um, and it's important that, they've heard, they've, that they are heard. And so this is why the conversation tonight matters. And this is why the YMCA and the Red Clay School District partnership um, matters. And so we understand that it takes a community. We understand that we have to work together to um, make that happen. So with this partnership, you all are invited to participate in some of our in-person and virtual programming that the YMCA offers. So we have a, a Black Achievers program that is currently running at the Walnut Street YMCA, um, which is we go on college tours, workplace tours, and provide scholarships to our graduating seniors. We also have a middle school youth and government program um, and a model UN program. And so our youth and government program is a national teen leadership program. Teens meet several months out the year um, to discuss and debate issues that affect Delaware citizens. Um, and so teens create and write proposed legislation, build development, um, they work in process debate, our judicial delegates are uh, writing legal briefs, appellate, they're learning about the appellate court system and how to perform oral arguments. So there's still time to register if students want to express their voices that way. Um, and I'll make sure that my email is available to everyone um, so that they are able to participate. Um, and if you're also wanting to get your voice heard and participate in one of our videos, a part of our video projects, please feel free to reach out to myself or Dr. Bond. We would love to have your voice heard and, and make sure that everyone else hears it. So again, um, thank you, Mr. Goder. And I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, and I'm looking, looking forward for a great discussion. You know, Anisha, as you speak about your work with the YMCA, it brings me back to a comment that was made uh, during our last town hall for, from a community member around organizing student groups. And actually this particular comment was around organizing and supporting student artwork. You know, we really appreciate the partnership with you and, and, and allowing you to help us along and really leveraging student voice uh, in our school district. Uh, so to turn to one of our student panelists on, on this very note, you know, you know, Grant over at AI High, can you share some experiences that that you've had with expressing your voice there at the school. Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Golder. So throughout my time at AI, since freshman year, I've always been involved in, in different things. So I've, I've been in the band since freshman year. I'm, I'm now the drum major this year. I've been, uh, I've played soccer and lacrosse. And, you know, I go to such a, I'm very lucky I go to such a diverse school and, and really a, um, a whole district that I get to meet all these different people and especially within each activity I do whether it's you know sport or band you meet different people in between there and I think it's really important when you're in those places to talk to those people that you wouldn't normally have the opportunity to meet and especially with that which I'll, I'll touch to this a little more later once once you get to meet those people and they meet other people 
in that thing, it, in that um, activity, you really branch out into more activities. And I mean, especially at AI, if you look at, if you look at just say the band, which most people in the band are um, involved in sports or other clubs. And I think that really speaks to everyone talking to each other and having conversations about, you know, what you want to do and, you know, and stuff like that. And also I think it's very important to always be looking for another opportunity. For example, this, I, you know, I didn't know anything about this. And this summer I, I got a call from uh, Mr. Paladinetti and another example of a new opportunity, which if I wasn't involved in those other things, maybe I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known about. And I think it's just, once again, very important to, to speak with others. And I think, I think I've done that. I think that's why I'm, I'm involved in so many different things and have these opportunities. That's awesome. It's awesome. Part of the, the famous AI band that has just been historically famous in, in, in the Red Clay School District for sure. You know, as we talk about student voice within each of our schools, I'd, I'd love to dive into a little bit with you on, on how we can elevate student voice here in Red Clay. You know, and so, so Gavin, I'm, I'm going to turn to you. You know, can you share some thoughts around how we incorporate student voice and how we can incorporate more voices around the table in our school buildings? Hi. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm very excited about it. Um, and when it comes to elevating student voice at AI, one of the things I'd say is get a more diverse group of people there, not just top of the class. I noticed that all the people that get to speak at things like this are always the students you see in your school speaking to a crowd. Like Grant's the drum major. I, I'm in band and talk a lot in band. I mean, it's always the same people who are the top of the class. And I think you shouldn't have to be a part of some special club to have a voice in your schools. Great point, great point. And when we talk about that a lot, really, about it just not being the same group of students that are sort of always the ones at school giving the, the, the information to the adults and always the one that have the opinions. You know, it's a great point, Gavin. And I'm wondering if anyone else has experiences similar to this. Uh, Daniela, can you share a little bit about your student experience at Dickinson? Well, I'd like to reintroduce myself uh, I'm Daniela, I'm a senior at Dickinson, and let's see. I come from a background where my parents are immigrants, I'm an immigrant, and they just don't really know about the K-12 system like that. And they also lack uh, fluency in the English language, so I kind of had to navigate my way around the education system, uh, majorly, like, by myself. Um, and with that being said, once I... you know, I get a decision in my eighth year. I knew that I didn't want to go to my feeder school because I heard a lot of things about like fights and stuff like that. And, you know, for somebody wanting to go to college, that that's not really something that I probably would be able to focus well in my classes if I had to deal with that. And in general, like I just didn't really think that that was like a good environment for me. And so I ended up, um, what's it called, uh, choicing into the Design Thinking Academy, which was a uh, very new, charter school, a very small charter school. And, um, and they found out that there wasn't, you know, a good curriculum. It was, there wasn't really any AP classes, any IB classes. And it was just kind of bad for, you know, somebody wanting to go to college again. But the good thing about it was that because it was so small, my counselor was able to reach out to me and just tell me about all of these different opportunities that I did not know about. Before I used to think that only sports and like, you know, activities inside the school were, you know, kind of limited to, but then he opened up um, different opportunities for me outside of school, like Teen Shep, which is a college prep program for Black and Latinx students. Um, and then that's when in Teen Shep, that's when I actually learned about the fact that Design Thinking Academy wasn't preparing me for um, my aspirations. And with Teen Shep, I really like Teen Shep because they basically um, they helped me like, and support me. They showed me the types of things that I had to do. And, um, and they also had connections, like they made connections with my parents, even though they lacked the English language. My parents were always there when I was getting advice from um, their counselors. And they told me about different programs. And one of them was actually the IB program at Dickinson. 
And another one was actually like the Telluride Association summer program this summer that I attended with a 3% admissions rate. And I was able to get a full scholarship to attend that six week program. And it would have been at the University of Maryland, but you know, with the corona and all that, it wasn't really, I wasn't able to. But the fact is that I wouldn't have known about these things if it wasn't for Teen Chef. And now I'm getting ready to apply to top colleges with good financial aid packages that won't leave me in debt like most people kind of talk about. You know, if you go to college, it's just going to leave me in debt. But those are the types of colleges that Teen Chef is introducing me to. And, and then looking back at my, you know, education and like everything that I had to do, when I was getting, you know, ready to register for Dickinson, I talked to the counselors and uh, something that stood out to me was the fact that they didn't really tell me about these, you know, different classes, like college prep um, and like honors and like the difference between like those classes compared to AP and the International Baccalaureate program. Of course, I already knew about this because of Teen Sharp, but I was wondering, I had straight A's my ninth and 10th grade year, and I would have thought that maybe they would have recommended me for those classes, but they didn't. And in a way, I can't really blame them because usually there's only like one or two counselors per school, like, or one counselor per like 100 students, and they probably have a whole bunch of things in their mind, but it would have been really good for them to have told me, and I hope it's not because of bias or because I'm brown or anything like that, but it just would have been nice um, if they had told me. And at Dickinson, I keep kind of seeing these types of themes, like just the lack of awareness that students have and the lack of, you know, reaching out from like the staff to um, colored students. Like we don't actively, you know, tell each other, hey, we can do this and that. It doesn't feel as much as a community that'll help us grow and really reach our potential. We don't really give each other candid feedback and really go, um, and focus on our growth and missing gaps or filling each other up with knowledge about different opportunities and how to navigate our way, uh, knowing the different options and their specifics and basically how to get there. Um, um, and especially us underrepresented students, most of us color students who are most likely first generation college students and might also be struggling with immigration issues like my dreamers out there, my undocumented students with and without DACA. Uh, we might be misunderstood. Sometimes we don't know if we should question or ask for uh, help. And common sense isn't always common. And, you know, we just kind of stick with the default and kind of go with the flow and accept what is given, even if it's not really what will prepare us to reach our full potential. Like college prep classes, a student might be taking college prep classes thinking, you know, that they will be prepared for college just because of the title, but in reality, they won't. I really appreciate that, Danielle. Really good tangible examples of how we can provide a more inclusive environment. And if you ever want any information on University of Maryland, you are talking to the right guy. I am a Terp, always have been a Terp, and uh, it, I, I bleed the red, gold, and black. So you tell me if you want to be a University of Maryland student, we'll talk. All right, so Gavin, from what you said earlier, uh, and now that you've heard Daniela, does this sort of spark anything based upon what you were talking about? So as a white student at AI, I actually have very different experiences when it comes to uh, being, you know, recommended to programs, being offered AP classes and things like that. Uh, I was actually hounded to join like the early college academy. I spent my entire ninth grade year having to tell my teachers, no, I'm not going to take it because it messes with my schedule. Uh, I got to hear about all of the programs and I even got like pulled aside and told, hey, you can take this AP class. And I wonder why am I having a different experience than she is? And I think we know the answer and it's, it could be many answers, but for me, a ninth grader, to be told about all these programs last year and then hear this year that someone didn't get all those opportunities is kind of strange to me. That's very powerful, Gavin. And, and that's the kind of thing that sometimes the, the people wearing the shirts and ties and the suits miss. And so it's important for us to hear those kinds of stories from Daniela and from you, because it paints a very powerful picture for us as we have these conversations at the district level. Now, Zakia, as I, as I listen to, to Daniela and Gavin uh, and, and they share their experiences, I'm reminded a little bit of some of your 
uh, experiences at Cab Callaway. Can, can you share a little bit about your leadership roles and how all of this plays together for you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Golder. Um, my experience as a student leader has uh, really opened my eyes to a lot. Um, I believe around sophomore years where I started to really try to find my voice and where I really wanted to put my passion into uh, certain things. Um, it started within uh, my Black Culture Club when we started that my sophomore year. Um, and then at my school, it just kind of branched out into uh, other leadership roles, such as becoming class president and now doing a uh, student representative. Um, my biggest thing that I learned throughout my entire experience was just seeing the division amongst uh, people, even within the same grade, and what we as students could do for each other to bridge those gaps. Um, Specifically, as an African-American student, I realized that we can only take the opportunities that we make for ourselves. And as a student leader, showing my classmates that as important as it is to be culturally aware within your own groups and community, allowing others to experience those things as well is the only way that we can reach a common ground of understanding, whether you're a student leader or you're just someone that is casually going by the four years of high school. Um, so in being a leader, I try to stress that knowing that you know, uh, if you're a minority and you're attending a majority white school, that you're feeling comfortable in your own skin and your culture, and that is very important. But also, and just a specific example, knowing that some of my white friends are very interested in attending HBCUs or um, colleges that are um, majority minority. Uh, I try to help those people navigate uh, into that culture and get them to interact with students who can give them more insight so that now they feel comfortable and want to learn more. Um, and hopefully in doing that, we all form close relationships with one another. And being a student leader, I learned allowing people to be comfortable can really open people's eyes. That is outstanding. And that's, that's great to hear from you as a Cat Calloway student. And it's, and it's a perfect segue, really, uh, to Nathan. Now, Nathan, you were, of course, part of and one of the organizers of the student town hall that was held at the end of August. And during that town hall, you actually outlined some actionable steps uh, for, for the school district to take. Uh, steps, uh, uh, at least one that spoke specifically uh, to programming options for students. Can you sort of outline and elaborate on that for us? Yeah, so um, actually Daniela was on my organizing team for the town hall and I heard about her story and I related to it so much because as a child from an immigrant family, like I was totally lost in the American educational system. Like I didn't know how important APs were and I didn't know all like the various amount of programs outside of schools and extracurriculars and sports. Like, like Daniel said, all I thought to school was sports and doing like science or whatever. And um, it was just really hard to kind of navigate that because at those kinds of assemblies at my middle school at the end of eighth grade, it was kind of like the introduction to high school. There was nothing, there was nothing about what APs were, or how important they were. There was kind of just like the baseline of, you should already know what these are. And like Daniela said, common sense is not always common. Like I didn't have that kind of knowledge to help me navigate through what high school would be like. And like Daniela, I'm also a part of Teen Sharp and they were also such a big help with that. And at my town hall, I felt like this was something we needed to address because a lot of minority students and a lot of students from immigrant families don't have that kind of support to be successful outside of school and in those kind of programs that help them in and out of school. So at the actual town hall, we kind of said, we need more transparency when it came to these. We need our guidance counselors to be more interactive with the students to kind of inform them of what programs are available. And actually after the town hall, I had a discussion with my own guidance counselor at Conrad, and we actually had a really deep and informative conversation on how she can help inform students at our school of how to apply for these programs if they're eligible and kind of tell them that there are opportunities outside of just sports and um, internal things at school. And I feel like this is a message we kind of need to give to every single school in Delaware because this is not a, this is not a unique situation like students in every school experience this, but their stories are often unheard. And I feel like, especially when it comes to um, success outside of school, this is uh, an area that I feel like a lot of minority students need to have that support and foundation in. So I felt like that was such a big part of the tunnel. And I'm really glad that my school is actually taking those kind of steps. I mean, we do have a long way to go, but I'm glad that they are taking those first steps. And yeah, it was an impressive evening for sure. And really kind of a, it was kind of cool for us because we had our initial town hall, then the student town hall, 
And then you kind of bring back this opportunity to kind of talk about that and kind of pull the two together. So it really, I think, has been uh, sort of a perfect uh, order of, of how we've kind of gotten the, the program started here this year. And it leads me really now to watch another video. We love hearing from our alumni uh, as well as our current students. And uh, this is from one of our very own Red Clay community members. Isha is an alumni and we're thankful for her uh, sharing her voice and ag advocacy uh, certainly with all of us. So here's our video uh, from Isha. <laughs> I know I have experienced racism throughout my life as a person of color in the workplace, in my high school, and in my university now with a lack of diversity, but I don't think I ever recognized it until recently. Uh, my high school that I'm a recent alum from has started to use social media to post about experiences that students had, and I realized racist experiences, and I realized that a lot of them I can relate to, which made me realize first saddened me, and second made me realize that I need to bring about change for the students that come after and for anyone in the society that we live in. And so I kind of started using social media as a starting point, but, and I, I did my petition signing, I donated a little bit that I could, and I read a lot about what it is that maybe I'm doing to perpetuate racism in the society. But recently, I've also started calling and emailing legislators, uh, trying to set up meetings to amplify Black voices specifically, and pushing my old high school and my university now to take action about what they plan on doing to make the environment's more diverse. And a little promo there in case you missed it. We want to hear your voice. And that's at tawanda.bond at redclay.k12.de.us. Uh, please send us your story so you can be a part of future town halls. Uh, just a little plug for you there, uh, Dr. Bond, in, in the equity office. So, so Isha asked the very important question uh, of, of how she's perpetuated racism and how she can provoke change. And, and that's really the basis for many of the questions we're going to continue to be focusing on as we start this work. How can we reflect on our own actions? And then we start looking at what we can do to provoke change. So, so Nathan, as we dive into students and how they can advocate for that change, can you share more about the town hall and some of the ideas? You know, you, you had this town hall that you co-hosted. So what came up about students perpetuating the change? Yeah, uh, I actually relate to Isha a lot because just like her, I didn't really recognize what racism was, especially in my early years. And, you know, going forward, I did have that total shift in mentality going into high school. And to be honest, the town hall was kicked off by the first Red Clay Town Hall. And to be honest, the first Red Clay Town Hall was not great. It didn't really address student needs and it kind of felt like you were beating around the bush. So after that, I was like, I, there was a flame lit under me. I was like, I need to do something about this. So I actually messaged Mr. Armay, who is the director at Teen Sharp. And I said, I wanted to get, I want to get something started. I want to amplify student voices, which was something so missing from the first town hall. And I kind of collected a group of students from Red Clay, including Daniela and some of my classmates at Conrad. And we were like, what are problems specific to students, especially minority students that, that we're not addressing in the first hall that we need to address now? And that's kind of how everything got kicked off. We've had, we've had weekly meetings talking about what are we doing and how can we convey this message the best and who are we giving this message to? And, you know, we really wanted to put that focus on student voice. So at the actual town hall, we kind of asked that all the administrators, all the adults mute themselves until, um, until asked not to, because we really wanted the focus to be on student issues and student voice, because student voices have been so silenced for so long. And oftentimes students are in the dark about what's happening in their own neighborhoods. And I feel like it's really time that we amplify their voices and finally give them the information and the light that they need. And it was a great evening. I mean, it was a moving evening. It was hard for me to keep my mic off because I like to talk, Nathan, but I followed the rules and I, I stayed quiet for you. As, as you think more about that night, um, 
what what really as educators can we do in the environment to help this along? Can you share a little more about some of the narratives that were talked about that night around the specific classrooms in Red Clay? Yeah, uh, in the actual town hall, we kind of talked about a lot of the implicit bias that is present in a lot of our school officials. Uh, like, especially in the classroom, a lot of black and brown students are treated as not as smart, or there are lower expectations for them that can lead them to not be as successful in their high school career. And we felt that we really need to change that because, you know, we are blocking these students off from the mountains of success that they could achieve. And we really wanted to kind of spur some change in one, the administrators, two, the teachers, and three, the district officials to kind of address every single level of where this racism and implicit bias occurs. And we really were egged on by social media because social media gave a platform for students who anonymously come forward about their stories in and outside the classroom, but inside their district. And I feel like we never talk about these stories in the actual classroom and how these microaggressions, how these instances of racism kind of slip through the cracks because students don't want to come forward. There's an environment of silence or that there is unresponsiveness from the actual school slash district itself. And I felt we really needed to address that. Gavin, I'm interested in your thoughts around this of how we can create a more just and equitable educational environment. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think what, Na uh, what Nathan said right at the end there about people not wanting to speak up, and I think that's an important topic we should focus on. And like I was talking about earlier, those conversations, and now in, in a different term, but the same sort of thing, people interacting with each other inside the school and getting involved in more things. So then they can, like Gavin was saying, get a seat at that, at that table. And it, it can be hard to, to speak up alone. And I think that's why it's really important to, especially it really, it's hard, especially to, you know, uh, staff and especially administrators. So I think it's really important to to speak to each other and their students. And example of this is Nathan, who who started the that town hall and and led to a lot of these things. And I think it's very important to to have those conversations and have a an area to speak up without having um, without getting in trouble. You know what I'm Absolutely, and having the comfort to, to, to have those conversations. I, I appreciate that, Grant. Now, Daniela, I'm interested in your thoughts on this a little bit. What have you experienced within the classroom, and how do you see us sort of encouraging this more equitable environment? Yeah, that's actually very interesting. Um, actually, last year in one of my classes, um, so it's my African American friend uh, and I. Uh, we sit like on one side of the class. I just, I just think it's important um, for that to be noted. And then the rest of my peers kind of sit on the other side, and they're all white uh, of our white peers, and the teachers are also white. And you know they usually joke around and stuff, and it's usually fine. We sometimes like joke around with them too, and it it's fine. Um, like they they're good people, honestly. But then you know it comes to the point where it kind of like crosses the line and they start joking about like mexicans crossing the border and how we should be paying for the wall and stuff like that and i don't know i, I just like that really caught me by surprise because that was one of the only times uh like one, one of the first times that i experienced that type of racism in in the classroom and it was pretty much like pretty explicit i wouldn't really call it a microaggression um and then like another thing too, recently, there was a, another student that was kind of just talking about uh, how the media makes racism seem like it's worse than it is. Um, and I've also heard that this student in particular doesn't really believe in systematic racism and things like that. And, and then like what I, like, I mean, I guess things like that are gonna happen, but the thing that I didn't really like is the fact that the teacher kind of made it seem like a debate. And, and like they encouraged it, like if it was a debate, like if it was something that, you know, their opinion was as valid as mine, like their opinion had as much merit as mine and my other peer who was also very upset about this. Um, and I felt like we could have been used in, like teachers could have used that type of, those type of situation as a learning lesson, like a lesson where, you know, 
there's like less like this doesn't happen again basically it wasn't it was just encouraged as a debate and i don't, I don't really know I, I don't really appreciate that it also stems again from ignorance from even from teachers sometimes us students have to talk to the teachers and like in both cases i talked after class to both of those teachers and i mean honestly i'm not really sure myself if things are gonna happen um well like because nothing has happened yet from the institution but i'm gonna continue to keep you know pushing forward because you know no, but like these types of things is just gonna keep happening if if we don't like talk about it and keep putting pressure. Not just on that we get a let's feel like like yes, it's gonna make us feel upset, but let's not stop. Like we gotta keep doing stuff and and keep like pushing because we, this is just unacceptable. And um, so when I was thinking about this as well, I was thinking about particularly with the jokes made about like Mexicans. I was thinking about how. You know, in, in history classes, you know, we don't really teach as much people that look like me, people that look like uh, my African-American friends or my Asian friends. Uh, we don't really talk about those types of things. And and sometimes I feel like it, it, we might shy away from it because things might get too political or whatever the case might be. But something that I really like this year is that in my ELA class, my, uh, my teacher makes it like sometimes we're talking about like the feminine lenses and like african-american lenses and he started off with some slides talking about how you know this is kind of unapologetic unapologetically a political and we kind of we kind of can't shoo away from that like it, it's it's bound to happen that my body is ends up being political uh and other african-american uh like our bodies are just they become political our situations become political our history becomes political we kind of just can't shoo away from that um, but that's something that I really like that Dickinson is doing, at least in this particular ELA class. And, but yeah, with the, with our history classes, if we just had classes that, you know, taught uh, with, with, with like a lens of mine, with, with um, I, like, I would just love a, a history that kind of just lets people be more understanding and just less ignorant. And I would love a history class that would also take ownership with the mistakes and how those mistakes were overcome so that it doesn't, you know, put a false narrative that we're doing things because, you know, all we're doing is neglecting at the end of the day. And something else that I, I, I was thinking about was when transitioning um, to Dickinson, I had the option to either take the French class or a Spanish class. Uh, in my g and in 10th grade, I wasn't taking any type of languages. Um, and so I wanted to take my French class, uh, but I was kind of encouraged more and like pushed more to, you know, take the Spanish class instead of the French class, just because, you know, it would have been an easy A or whatever the case may be. But I really wanted to do French because I wanted to grow as a person. I already kind of mastered the Spanish language. I tried the Spanish class for a few days, but it, it was too easy, first of all. And, and it wasn't helping me grow as a person, as a student, as a scholar. And I wanted to take that French class really bad. And I kept pushing and pushing. And eventually, I did get the French class. But the fact is, I just don't like the fact that I had to do that. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if it has to do with uh, the people thinking that I'm not going to be able to succeed in these in this class. Or or I, I don't know. But I, I'm able to do it. And I, I've been getting straight A's in, these, in this French class. And I've actually found it to be one of my easiest classes. <laughs> so yeah, and, and to kind of take up all of this, say maybe some type of implicit bias training and just some type of training that won't let teachers kind of take uh, like these types of situations and make it a debate instead of make it some type of learning lesson because I don't know, we just have to do better. Outstanding, and it's those types of personal narratives again that sort of give us the picture, I think, as the adults in district office. So I really appreciate those stories. So that's a perfect way now to turn to Dr. Bond in our equity office. And as a representative of, of the school district, uh, can you uh, talk a little bit more, Tawanda, about what has been done and how we're working to address some of these concerns in Red Clay? Well, first I wanna thank you all for being so brave. You know, we have a lot of conversations now with the adults um, in our district about creating brave spaces for these types of courageous conversations. So Danielle, I was taking some notes while you were talking, so I'm gonna to refer to some of the things that you mentioned um, in your talk. So I always say, 
If we do not take the time to explore our own hidden biases and understanding of race and racism, it is difficult for us, us as the adults, to have effective conversations with our students around race and racism. So that's really, really where it begins. So on that premise, where we began in our district with professional learning was really around culture. You know, the culture of our workplace, the culture of how we interact with students um, and things like that. And in that vein, we started a professional learning with our district and, uh, district and school administrators around intercepting bias. So like Nathan said, like the implicit biases are things that sometimes come up that bubble up that our biases people may not know they have, but they ultimately affect decisions that they make, which becomes detrimental to our students. And that is something that can't happen. We've also done some professional learning around unpacking systemic and systematic bias and discrimination, because again, we as the adults are the ones that handle and control the accessibility for students. Students don't determine how much access they have to high rigor courses. That we as the adults are the gatekeepers. So we as the adults need to understand where the systemic discrimination and bias may happen in policies and procedures and things that may have been as they always have been, right? But we have to look at the systematic piece and at what Daniela said, we have to do better. So once we know better, we have to do better. So that's really the piece that our, our district leaders and our school leaders have really unpacked around the systemic and the systematic and how we can really make change um, to create a more equitable and fair environment. Um, I was really happy we had a, a really nice professional learning that all of our teachers did um, in September and it was all about discussing identity and bias with our students. So it really went back to kind of the concepts that I've heard all, you, all of you uh, mentioning around people being in a place where they have enough tools in their toolbox to have conversations that may be emotional and it not be a debate, like Daniela said, but it'd be more about listening to understand because it's not about putting our opinions onto students. It's about creating an environment in which our students can be critical, learn, critical learners and be able to have critical conversations. So we had a professional development led by two of our nationally board certified psychologists, Ms. Kelly Nickel and Ms. Laura Bitzer um, from Conrad and Brandywine Springs, and also one of our nationally certified art teachers, um, Ms. Irene Harrison. And it was facilitated across our whole district. So every teacher in every building got to participate in this professional development that was led by our diversity champions. And in that professional development, we unpacked and self-reflected. We talked about our vulnerabilities, our strengths, our needs. We talked about creating anti-bias classroom environments and looking at ways that we as the adults can manage strong emotions and uh, uncomfortable conversations. And then we also did uh, provided some resources and some tools around structuring conversations in a way that again, we are listening to understand because as we hear right, we hear from what you guys are saying, you, you wanna be heard, not necessarily debated, not, you know, put into a place where another opinion is put on you because you are critical learners. You are global citizens. You do have a voice. Well, Dr. Baum, while I've got you here in the spotlight, I do have some, some, some really rich questions that came up from our previous town hall. And, and the first one came from a rising senior at the Conrad Schools of Science. And this student asked, uh, what are the district's plans in integrating more history of all minority groups. This is that question about Eurocentric history and it's sort of the point that Daniela was making earlier. So I wanna break down just a couple of parts and I know Mr. Golder is our moderator for the evening, but I, but I have to put a few uh, kudos out because you know we hear what you guys are saying and Mr. Golder has really been working behind the scenes with our leadership to really start to determine like how we can best market our courses and our pathways in a manner that is equitable and accessible, particularly to our students of color. Some examples that he's had conversations with district leadership about are course names in our catalogs that came out from our student town hall. Um, you know, looking at CP and some of, some of you all were on that town hall telling us what some folks think CP stands for, um, which is, is not necessarily what it does, but we need to make sure that we are transparent. Um, some other uh, examples are things like targeted advisement opportunities for our students of color and providing more in-depth conversations like Nathan was saying, um, particularly with our students, um, our students of color. And then taking a really close look at our middle school programming 
making sure that we are not having unintended barriers that are in for students that would um, eliminate their opportunity to participate in high rigor courses when they get to high school. So that's a lot of work that Mr. Golder is doing behind the scenes right now. And then we're currently working on our instructional framework, which will essentially, when it's done, be how we do business when it comes to curriculum as a district. And two key concepts that we are working on right now are equitable classrooms, as well as culturally, personally, and socially responsive teaching. Now, there's a lot that sort of falls under that, but those are the major tenets. A couple of things that I just want to point out that we're, active, that we're actively engaged in right now is we have a social justice standards committee. And that's a committee comprised of teachers from all of your schools, K-12, cross content. So it's not just English or math, it's music teachers. Um, we have a lot of folks on that committee. And what we're looking at is the critical practices for anti-bias education with two particular standards that we're focused on this year. And they are identity and diversity. And when we talk about identity and diversity, it's really about those conversations about who am I, who are you, where do we all fit? How can we work together where we, have, we empower each other and we don't look down on people that are not like us? It's all about pride, confidence, healthy self-esteem without denying the value and dignity of others. And giving students really the opportunity to learn about history and the lived experiences of other folks that may look like us or may not look like us, but that's not in a superficial or oversimplified manner. That's awesome. And I, I know you spoke a little bit to the disproportionality in the upper level classes. We did have a question from a John Dickinson uh, student and I asked about this uh, sort of lack of representation of minority students in high rigor coursework. So you talked a couple of strategies there. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I just believe that as we've done a lot over the years in removing barriers, removing things like prerequisites and things like that to give more access. Uh, to folks to many of these high rigor courses, but I think the, that we have a lot more work to do and, uh, and you know, more, more, more ways to go. So, but we're on the right path, I believe. And I think with this group and even expanding and hearing more voices at more schools, we can collaborate and work together to make sure that nobody is falling through the cracks. Yeah, I mean, we always talk about, hey, I want to walk into a classroom at Dickinson and not be able to guess that it's an IB class. I want to walk into a class at AI High and not be able to guess that it's an, an AP class. I shouldn't be able to know that as soon as I walk into a room. And, and, and that's when that, that I believe we know when we've come a long way. When I walk in and I look at the class and I say, I don't know what this class is because I'm unable to make that determination when I walk in the room. So that's my dream. But as we move forward, we've heard from many students tonight uh, about how they feel about encouraging students to be engaged. Now, Abby, I know you bring a bit of a, a different perspective talking about the extracurricular side of things and some of the experiences you've been through. So can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on student engagement? Of course. So I personally am a three sport athlete as well as participating in many clubs and activities throughout my school. So the way I found myself getting involved in a lot of these clubs and activities was through the teachers that lead these activities or through students that have previously been in the activities coming to me and saying, hey, I've seen you around. I think you would be interested in this. So when I got involved with these, I took it upon myself to become one of those students that goes around and tries to help get people involved. So I'll take my time and I'll go talk to freshman classes and I'll say, hey, like we're doing this club or this activity. If you think it sounds like something you would be interested in, you can come talk to me. Here's the teacher that's in charge of this. This is how you can get involved here. And I've been really just going around talking about how I got involved with sports and how I got involved with clubs and trying to encourage students uh, to get involved with something. Even if it's not something that I'm involved with, I go around and I try and say, hey, this is an awesome club that's opening up, or here's this awesome opportunity. If you're interested in it here, you can go talk to this person. You can talk to this person about this. And then on top of that, I also work with my student council and we run like homecoming week, we decorate hallways. So I work and I put announcements into the morning announcements and things, hey, go help your class. 
like stay they're staying after school these few days to get ready for this why don't you see if that would if that would be interested to you why don't you stay after and help as well and just trying to get the word out about clubs and activities and part of what's going on in with covid it's caused us to lose these clubs and these opportunities which is a major part of high school to make these connections with other students outside of the classroom which means that we're losing the, a big chunk of high school. So we really need to also focus on figuring out ways that we can involve these clubs and activities, even through this pandemic where schools are opening, not opening, virtual ha halfway, not virtual the other half. We have to figure out how we can start bringing some of these back. We also, we brought back sports already, but some kids' sports aren't their thing. So how can we bring back these other clubs like the Daniela's club that she runs the minorities go to college. How can we bring that back? How can we bring back our student council clubs and get these clubs back up and running to help give this connection back to schools? That's awesome, Abby. And it is all about inviting uh, folks to the table and inviting folks to the conversation. You know, Zakia, what has been your experience around inviting students to conversations about activities at CAD? Um, you know, with everything going on uh, with our current situation and just everything going on in the world and stuff like that, um, I think just as students, it is uh, important for us to just really understand that we have to be connected with each other because we are all, you know, people. We're all students. So in order to encourage students to really, you know, um, not only find the activities that work for you, but find the activities that will allow you to connect with somebody who you may have never even thought that you would have talked to is just really reaching out and figuring and just figuring out yourself and having sympathy for each other and knowing that we're all going through the same exact thing. And sometimes we don't realize that we put uh, ourselves in these little groups of, oh, well, I'm only hanging out with these people because, you know, it's just as simple as, oh, we all play the same sport. So this is, um, you know, the groups that we hang out in. But um, encouraging students to just start conversations with each other and to really reach out to one another. Um, I find that especially with um, current events happening and all of that stuff, specifically with minority communities, um, it comes off as this immense amount of uncomfortability uh, where we've feel that we are almost silenced to where bringing up a current event, something that uh, is a rapid fire in our community, it is almost, it, it almost seems or is deemed as inappropriate. So it may make us feel uncomfortable to not be able to go out into those other groups and really um, just express how we feel. So roundtable discussions or having groups and clubs really present their information to student bodies about what they do, what their importance is, um, you know, and the impact that they can make on, you know, other students' lives. That's what we've been really trying to push um, at CAB, just knowing that it doesn't matter the skin color, the gender, the political belief, anything that you are interested in or anything that you think that you might be interested in. When you're a senior, by the time you graduate, go for it. Just, you know, figure, uh, try different things, figure out if it is your thing. If you don't like it, you know, things happen, but, you know, just really kind of pushing that out of bounds, let's, uh, let's almost feel uncomfortable to the point where we can be comfortable in having those hard discussions, having those uh, hard interactions with each other, and knowing that we come from different backgrounds and different environments, but overall there's a level of togetherness in just being students, especially with the whole entire coronavirus situation, the situation and all of us learning off of, you know, different platforms online and stuff like that. So as students, it has been our job to form connections with each other and really reach out to one another to have those uncomfortable interactions so that we can have a level of understanding. But as administrators and staff, we have strongly recommended that forming those bonds with other students, with um, you know, the students that you may not have classes with or the students that you may not teach, uh, starting clubs for just about anything will really allow students to feel safe in sharing their stories and opening up to you know either other students or other staff members so that they can assist in spreading those things to others as well getting comfortable with being uncomfortable i love that Zaki. you guys you guys are doing an awesome job here as we move now to nathan you know in the student town hall nathan uh there was some suggestions really around this this idea can you share some of those with the group yeah, a big point that we touched on was student representation. And I felt like this is a 
field that red clay does need a lot of growth in. Like even before all of this, I would I would have considered myself an active student in red clay and I didn't know three quarters of the things going on in my district. And I only got an insight into what the district was doing after I put on that town hall and after I like sent emails to all the district officials. And it shouldn't take that whole ordeal to for me to finally as a student for me to finally get an insight into what's happening in my district and that's why i feel like student representation is so important because we need those connections to the committees to the board to the district to know what is going on and kind of what decisions are being made and how that's going to affect us as students because we are the student we as students live and breathe this district every single decision like cascades down to us and affects us tenfold. And I feel like we really need to have that seat at the table. And at the town hall, we really wanted a student rep on the board. We know that was in discussion at the time, but we really wanted to show our support for that because we do need that student rep on the on those high level decisions that are going to send waves throughout our district and possibly our state. And we wanted, and we also touched upon the diversity committee and we really wanted student voices to be a part of that because as students of color, we are kind of at the bottom of the pyramid here and we need that kind of voice and we need that platform where we can stand up and speak about our issues and speak about what we want to see in our district so that we can get the support that we need and so that we can be on the same level as every other student because we often are not. And um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Miss, not Mr. I'm sorry, Dr. Bond, um, mentioned last time that she she and the diversity committee passed some plans for the student diversity committee. So I feel like that is such a big step in getting that student representation, representation. but I do want to emphasize the need for student representation for everyone listening, that your students need to speak up and you as district officials need to create those spaces where students are able to comfortably and accessibly stand up and kind of give their opinion and say what they need and want, because we are the ones getting affected by everything. So we need to have that voice. You bet. And forums like this are a great way to start, but we sure we have a heck of a long way to go in that in that uh, job, Nathan. So it, it's really a good way now to turn to Mr. Green and to, you know, Mr. Green, can you share some more around your thoughts with having student representation on the school board as Nathan suggests? Yes, and so at our last board meeting, um, our board did um, vote in, in favor of a student representative on the board um, and that student representative will um, take hold and represent the student voice on our board starting the July, um, July um, 2021, 2022 school year. Um, so that will be, you know, in the hands of our policy committee uh, to investigate some national best practices around uh, student representation and what that actually looks like on a school board. So again, um, that was something that our board uh, did vote to support um, and again, that our students advocated for and obviously based on the, the student leadership and advocacy um, represented on this particular forum. Um, and what we also know is throughout uh, Red Clay, as we see and, and you know, things on the chat around the reopening of schools. Um, and, and one of the things that I just will touch on, and, and while this platform was you know, specifically for Student Town Hall, the, the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic, as it relates to, to the reopening um, of schools and where we stand as a result of that, um, is, is, is a powerful message, right? And, and so we, we understand that again, our experiences, you know, shape our bias, which leads to our actions is a quote that I like to, to live by. And so school is an experience. And we've heard from a number of our student experiences um, as it relates to what they've experienced at their representative schools. And then collectively, how can we come together as a district, as a diverse district that truly is a microcosm of our nation. I mean, when you look at the geographics that we cover as a district, but more importantly, the demographics in the various communities that we serve, you know, red clay is truly a microcosm um, of our nation. And, you know, we, we, we have, you know, a, a diverse student population, diverse socioeconomic population. There are different needs and means um, that we have to address as a district and take into account that once we hear that voice, how do we come together um, as a collective? As we said, it takes a community to really ensure that it's equity in terms of our response, knowing that each decision that we may make isn't necessarily gonna suffice for every student or every household, but it is in the effort and the good faith that we're taking to ensure um, that we are in a, a diverse, equitable and inclusive manner uh, addressing our diverse needs as a district. You bet, and if you did, have, did not get a chance to watch the, the town hall last night in regards to the reopening, that is um, 
uh, has been recorded and is on our website. If you wanted to uh, give yourself some time, take a look at that here uh, this evening. I do want to throw it back to Dr. Bond because along with student representation on the board, Nathan did mention the student representation on the diversity committee as well. So I wanted to give you a chance to, to touch on that. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to give sort of an overview. Um, we have as a diversity committee, our diversity champions will be developing student diversity committees at every secondary school. And Nathan, I am going to send you details um, because Nathan's group did make this as one of our requests. Um, and in addition to that, we will also be creating a student advisory uh, council to the diversity committee who will assist us as the diver district diversity committee as we roll out professional development and design frameworks that address the whole district. So I just wanted to share that piece. Awesome. So one thing that has been clear tonight is that we can empower one another for continued change. We have awesome students, awesome community members, pretty incredible stakeholders across the Red Clay School District. So I'd, I'd like to ask each of our panelists, we'll kind of go round robin on this one, to share their number one tip on how we can continue to empower one another. And Abby, I got to start with you because I forgot you earlier. So I'm going to start with you and your number one alphabetically to boot. Abby Campion, what is your number one tip? Um, I feel like my number one tip is while we do need to focus on things in the classroom and the diversity in the classroom and things like that, we also do need to focus on extracurriculars as well outside of just sports because those clubs are what help make connections. Like Daniela's Minorities Go to College Club has been extremely important for many students. I've seen the impact of that club. And I feel like getting these clubs and making sure that everyone in the schools knows about what's happening in the school, in their school and in other schools so that they can take those ideas and implement them into their own schools. Grant, let's go to you. What's your number one tip for empowering each other? So I think it's, it's been a big theme of tonight is conversation um, between students and especially between students and staff and students and, and staff at a, at a district level. And I'm just going to touch on that again. And that's, that's such an important part because if, if no one's using their voice and sharing their experiences, there won't be any change. And, and it's like, again, like I was saying earlier, it is, it is hard to speak out on your own. So, having those clubs and those opportunities that Abby talked about outside of sports um, is, is very important to, to empowering students. So Kia, what can you add to this uh, topic? Um, I think my number one tip would be to find what you are passionate about in terms of uh, it could be academically, it could be socially, find what you're passionate about and then use your resources to ask the right questions to really get what you want done. And it could be a teacher, a staff member, it could be uh, older students that you just look up to, but just really asking the questions that you find are important and just keep pressing those issues, keep asking those questions and change will, you know, most definitely come. Gavin? What is your number one tip for us this evening? I think one of the main things that stops people from speaking out is that they don't think they're allowed. They think that if they complain about something in the school system, they're going to get in trouble or they're not going to be listened to. And that just isn't the case. You have to try before you say, I'm not going to. You have to email the school board. You have to try to get your voice out there to make any change. And we can turn this into a top 10 of tips here. Uh, Daniela, what is your number one tip for the listeners this evening? Yeah, I mean, for the students, I would just say like, speak your truth, always question, and get a mentor, like your team or a community. Like, it could even just be your bestie. Like, if you're scared to do it by yourself, just, just do it and have somebody that's there to support you so that you don't feel alone or scared to do it. And, you know, just don't let your talent be wasted because you don't know or you don't see others doing what you might want to do. Again, my parents are immigrants. They work in the field, cutting mushrooms and stuff. Um, and, and we're going to be hearing a lot of us being the first. And, and this country still has a lot of firsts for here and there and whatnot. But, let, let, so like, don't let that discourage you. And also, like Gavin said, don't let things slide because you're not sure if you'll be heard. Like, you just got to keep pushing. Like, don't take no for an answer. And... and 
you know, just like, just don't take no for an answer. Nathan, I turn to you for your tip for tonight's listeners. Yeah, my main tip would probably be to group up. I feel like as student activists and students who are raising their voices, it can be pretty isolated isolating because we feel like not everyone thinks the way we do but trust me there are so many people out there who are willing to speak up they just need that catalyst they just need that someone to ask them to come forward and as you know there are strength in numbers so my main tip is to group up and kind of kick scream and shout and make those spaces for yourself as a community so that you can all come forward with your voices awesome anisha how about a uh, a tip from from a community partner. Absolutely. Daniela mentioned um, for the students to speak their truth and I would encourage for the adults in the community to listen. Um, and I think when we all listen and we all pay attention to what our young people are saying and sharing and their stories, things are able to happen. Um, and so I would challenge all adults to, to meet with the young child, let hear their story, share their story, ask them what they want to see, ask them what they want to see change. Um, and let's try to make it happen. Um, they, I truly believe that they have the answers. Um, so I think listening to understand and not to debate, debate um, is my number one piece of advice for community leaders um, and adults. And our final panelist for this evening, Dr. Bond, uh, what is your number one tip from the district to the listeners? Continue to critically think, self-reflect, and also always share your stories because you do have a voice. And that those are my three takeaways for everyone on this call and everyone watching. Incredible conversation tonight. We, we've covered awesome points, lots of different topics. One other question did come in from the town hall from last time, Dr. Bond. I did want to throw it out there, real good question. What is the proper protocol for someone who believes they have encountered racism in red clay. You know, I, this happens to me, I've got the, the, this event. Who do I vent to? Who do I go to? What's the protocol for me? Well, just listening to the panel here, I'm gonna just say, if you see something or hear something, say something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whenever I lead trainings, one of the things we talk about, and Megan, when we worked with her in our district, one thing she shared with us also is politeness and fear. They keep racism, discrimination, all of those things in place. So reach out to a staff member, reach out to an administrator. We are here for you. That is what we come to work every day to do. Our district has policies and procedures in place to address all forms of racism, as well as discrimination in any facet that it presents itself. So if you see or hear something, say something. Don't let fear and politeness keep anything in place when it should not be. And interestingly enough, we had another uh, comment that came in, and this is something maybe for future town hall, something for us to discuss. One of our students from the Meadowood program uh, commented that we need to talk more about race and disabilities and how all of that ties together. And I certainly couldn't agree more with that. So that may be as a topic as we continue uh, to push, push through here with further town halls. So once again, panelists, audience, I wanna thank you very much uh, for your thoughts tonight. Uh, you guys are an inspiration to us. I mean, you really truly are. You know, we've been, we've been sitting at home in quarantine for a while too. I mean, we're back in the office a little bit now, but we, we, we miss seeing students. And so to, to, to get your, you here, with these types of ideas, this type of rich conversation, it, it's exciting to people like us that just wanna, wanna be with students. You know? so, so it's awesome to see you're an inspiration to all of us. We thank you again, and we look forward to continuing these conversations here in the coming weeks, coming months, as we strive to make Red Clay the best district it can possibly be. So thank you to everyone and have a good night. believe the live stream and stop now so we're good to go
Great job, gang. Nice job, everybody. Good job, everyone. Good job. Good job, guys. My fingers were falling off. Good job. Good job. Um, there were a lot of comments on YouTube. I know, Gavin, you were watching the YouTube a little bit. I had another screen up watching YouTube. Um, we didn't want, I didn't want to respond as myself because they didn't even know I was on the call. So um, that's why I sent the quick message to Gavin just saying, hey, can you shoot a note out? Um, but that's why we didn't do a Q&A session. But there was a lot of talk about reopening. We knew that would be there, but there was also a lot of support for all of you for sharing your story and for being strong and proud and brave in being able to share your story. So all of you made a difference from the third party looking in, you made a difference and it was shown in the YouTube as well as just here. I'm very, I feel lucky to be able to be a part of this. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. So to Zakia, Gavin, Daniela, uh, Abby, Grant, Nathan, and Ms. Truesdale, thank you for joining us um, this evening and, and truly know. Um, again, I, I truly live by our experience to shape our biases, which leads to our actions. And, and so in order for us to have and provide and promote a rich experience for our students, you have to be a part of that inclusivity in terms of how we make decisions, how we listen, how we learn. Um, and so your continued advocacy is, is embraced and we will continue to support that. So, you know, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules. We know that there's a lot of uncertainty around reopening, but know that we're doing the best that we can to provide as much support again to our diverse school community as we can. So thank you for your time this evening. Good night guys. Good night everyone.